Hello everyone. Welcome, welcome. We are in week two of our pastoral care class. So today's topic is pastoral care versus pastoral counseling. Um, so when I first started my work as a hospital chaplain, I was nervous about cold calling, a term that comes from my sales representative days, right? Cold calling meaning going in to see a patient um, who maybe has not requested a visit, but it has been referred to me, um, or maybe they have requested a visit, but I don't know anything about them, right? Uh, so one of the ways that medical professionals learn about patients is by looking at the medical record, right? Doctors, nurses, chaplains, social workers, therapists, <coughs> dietitians, um, as part of the assessment process would be to look at the medical record to get some history and understand maybe what is going on for them during this hospitalization. That is all a very good use of that information. However, I know that for me and for uh, many of my colleagues, uh, some of that initial looking at the chart was out of my own um, vulnerability, right? I wanted to be prepared. I wanted to feel like I knew the situation that I was going into. And so looking at the chart helped me to do that. However, what happened is, is that that gave me a bit of a biased view of who I was going to meet, right? I knew their diagnosis, I knew about their medical history and some things that they were facing in this hospitalization, and therefore I would go in with a preconceived idea about them. Right? What I missed out on was the opportunity just to hear from them, allow them to lead the conversation and share the stories or talk about the things that they wanted to talk about uh, rather than me feeling like I knew what they needed, right? But I understood that that was my vulnerability, right? My anxiety about wanting to be effective and wanting to uh, be able to provide what they were looking for. Now, the same thing can happen in the parish, right? As, as a pastor, right? We have very well-intentioned ideas, right? They're coming to us for help, for guidance, and for support and we want to be there and we want to offer that guidance and support and sometimes out of that good intention we might tend to fall into the realm of um, trying to offer pastoral counseling uh, or continuing to meet with them um, when we really should be referring them on to to a therapist right a, a, a pastoral counselor or psychotherapist or spiritual counselor whatever whatever area of expertise um, would be most helpful, right? Um, so the question of pastoral care versus pastoral counseling uh, can be a little seductive, right? Uh, there's, there's gray areas. It can be confusing um, for pastors who are very sincere in their attempts to uh, provide care, uh, but then can suddenly find themselves in over their heads with somebody who needs more than what they really can offer, right? Um, Pastors have a relationship developed, right? It's different from me as a chaplain going in uh, and meeting someone for the first time, right? As a pastor, these folks that are coming to you are people that know you, people that trust you, people who uh, listen to you preach, who uh, participate in Sunday school or adult education, uh, people who sing in the choir with you or um, do mission trips, all of these ways, right? We fellowship with them, they know us, they trust us, and that is why they're coming to us, right? But then they also trust us to know our limits and our boundaries and when we need to refer them on to someone else, right? So pastoral care, as defined in the book, is a very broad and inclusive way of um, pastoral work concerned with the support and nurture of persons and interpersonal relationships, right? It's including everyday expressions of care and concern that might occur in the midst of various pastoring activities and relationships. Right? Uh, this is about our attitude and our presence, right? This is about having the skills that we learned about in last week's reading, um, to be an effective listener, an effective caregiver, right? It is about boundaries, right? We cannot be all things to all people and if you try as a pastor to meet all the needs of your congregation, you will burn out. And so self-care is a priority in pastoral care as well, right? That means having good boundaries, knowing your limits, and being able to refer when needed, right? Now pastoral counseling in the book 
is defined as caring ministries that are more structured, more focused on specific needs or concerns that have been raised, right? Counseling always involves some degree of a contract, um, which is a request for help around a particular issue, right? And so some, some guidelines are set up, right? There's, there's a treatment plan and a focus, a starting point and an end point, right? With our congregation members, uh, understanding that our role is more about the day-to-day -day support, the emotional nurture, and the grounding, and referring to a psychotherapist to do the work of attending to some of the deep uh, pain and suffering and help transform that into, into healing. Right. Now, we all have our different areas of expertise. As a hospital chaplain, my area of expertise was in the hospital, it was in the clinical setting, right? I knew the ebb and flow of the clinical setting, the hospital model. I know the different uh, specialty areas and how the system functions. I understand the medical language, the diagnosis and treatment plans, and how folks might have um, physical spiritual or emotional struggles as they're dealing with an illness or an injury, right? That was my area of expertise, how to manage all of that in the clinical setting, right? The pastor comes into the hospital to do the pastor work, right? And the chaplain is doing the chaplain work. And we work together as a team, right? Now, my area of expertise has shifted as the psychotherapist, right? So very much the same, my work is focused in this room, in this office, right? It is a contract, an agreement to work on very specific issues and problems, to help build skills and attend to those things. I'm still sending them back out to the pastor, much like I did as a chaplain, right? Trusting that they're gonna go back into their work, their home, their um, school, their community, their relationships, right? And my work stays here in the office that the pastor's work continues, to continue to support them and nurture them as they cope with their mental illness, but not treat the mental illness itself. Right? Um, our previous week's reading talked about a, a set of assessment skills in the medical model around listening, observing, evaluating, and determining interventions. In this week's reading, about pastoral care and counseling. Uh, the author offers um, a model of listening, learning, loving, and liberating, right? Um, so listening uh, is one of those skills that we constantly need to continue working on, right? How can we be present as a listener um, in the hospital? One of the ways that I would make sure that I was gonna be able to be present was to make sure that I attended to my physical needs, right? So have I eaten? Do I have enough water? Uh, have I gone to the bathroom recently? Right. So I'm tending to my physical needs as well as my spiritual need, right, of being able to be fully present with them in the midst of their struggle. I need to be free from my struggles, right? And I need to remind myself that I am not there alone, right, that God is with me. And so often I would um, talk to God um, on my way to somebody's room or to the emergency department or wherever it was that I was going, right? Um, not to remind God to be with me, right? But to remind me that, that God is there and to understand that my role is, is a tool, right? To be used by God for the benefits of those that I'm ministering to, right? So that God would help me be grounded. God would help me have um, words or not words, right? The presence um, to, to minister to the person that is in need, right? That um, that is my role in that setting, is to be listening, right? Learning is about being curious, about understanding why is the person talking about a particular topic or a particular person or what is it that they are focused in on, right? Because that gives us some insight into what their worries are in the moment, right? being able to observe that dynamic uh, as we learned about last time as well. Right? My husband likes to talk about his kindergarten teacher who says we have two ears and one mouth so that we listen twice as much as we speak. Right? Um, 
when we truly learn what the person's hopes and worries and fears are, then we can be in a position to understand if we are the ones that can help them as their pastor, or if their needs require more in-depth counseling, in which case we might need to refer them to a psychotherapist. <coughs> in the discussion posts that you have done from last week, and in the reflection papers that I've read so far, <coughs> I've uh, heard a lot about uh, the role of a pastor is to love. <coughs> For us to be effective as pastors, we are called to love. And that includes ourselves, right? We are called to love ourselves, and we are called to love the people that we are ministering to, the people that we serve, right? Now, love is not a feeling. It is an action word, right? So it is about attending to the person <coughs> in the ways that they need in this moment. It's about action, right? And action is sort of the fourth word of the model about liberating, freeing people uh, from their doubts and fears, right? Helping them manage their worries and anxieties. It's about advocacy when needed, being about fairness and justice, right? What, what needs to be in the community that is not available right now? <coughs> and how can we be knowledgeable about what the community does offer so that when we know that we are beyond our scope of ability, we know where we can direct our congregation member? Right. For example, uh, chapter 17 is about religious community religious resources, right? I read this chapter as a way of sort of the opposite of how it's written, right? What can I as a pastor learn from these institutions, from the hospital or the healthcare, the nursing home or a residential treatment program or a palliative care or hospice programs, right? can I go to them as the pastor and learn from them, right? Learn about advanced care directives, learn about ethics, learn about what um, support groups they might even offer in those settings that I might be able to refer someone to, right? Are there depression support groups, grief and loss support groups that are going on in those places that I can tap into when needed, right? And not feel like I have to do that all on my own, right? How can I learn about advanced directives and being able to help congregation members fill out their advanced directives, uh, the end-of-life care that's important to them, right? And chapter one also is about behavioral health units, right, mental health units. Uh, you may not see a lot of your congregation members if they are hospitalized somewhere for mental health uh, because those facilities might be far away. Um, but your role as a support person can be to help get them there, right? And part of the ways that you can help get them there is to understand what they have to offer. So again, maybe you have an opportunity to go and visit and learn, uh, but the book, this chapter, offers you a little bit about what happens in mental health units of hospitals or in residential treatment programs, right? Um, also, your role is to help destigmatize mental illness, right? Too often, there are misunderstandings that mental illness is a moral weakness or a personal failure, right? And there are people in your congregations with anxiety or depression or other uh, mental illnesses who are not going to say a word because they fear the stigma that comes with it, right? That people aren't going to understand them or support them. Right? So being able to use open and affirming language, right? Being able to talk about depression and anxiety and mental illness, to be able to normalize it rather than to um, make it some fearful thing that's out there, right? Uh, mental illness brings a sense of disconnection, right? Disconnection from ourself, disconnection from our family and loved ones, disconnection from God and our faith, right? It can bring feelings of abandonment, anger, shame, guilt, judgment, right? People can believe that they are flawed and broken and unrepairable, right? There's so much that happens in a hospitalization or a treatment center that helps to build up and restore a person, right? That educates, affirms, and strengthens the individual. Support groups that help normalize and, and, and 
bring commonality and support systems, therapies that are designed to build skills and resiliency, and to also help prepare for entrance back home, back to work, back to school, back to the community, right? As pastors, supporting your parishioners who might need hospitalization or residential treatment means having some knowledge about mental about what mental illness is and, and what it is not, right? You do not have to be an expert, just someone with love, compassion, and awareness. Now, this week's discussion post questions will be uh, available to you on Blackboard shortly. Uh, and a reminder that your assignment this week is about interviewing a mental health resources person, whether in your county or your regional area, uh, to be able to develop a resource list for you as a as a congregate, as a pastor, right? What are who are the people and what are the resources that you can provide when your folks come to you and need some support, right? Um, you will submit your paper uh, to me as well as to Dan or Elaine. And a reminder about two of the larger assignments, the uh, verbatim assignment, which is due February 21st. Hopefully you've already done your pastoral care visit and have written up the, the verbatim portion, the, the discussion visit portion, and you will now be able to do some reflecting on that. And secondly, the genogram assignment. Uh, hopefully you've taken a look at that and maybe you are already starting to work on your diagram of your family of origin Remember that you're going to do three generations, you, your parents, and your grandparents, right? So going up the generations, not down the generations. If you have children and grandchildren and you want to add them, you certainly may, but understand that that would be the fourth and fifth generation um, that you're going to be assessing and not just starting with you and going to your children and grandchildren. In other words, the goal is that you're looking back at your family and not forward at what's going forward in your family. Uh, I hope you have a great week. Uh, I know that we are expecting more snow here in the Twin Cities, so um, across the Midwest I'm sure as well. So I hope that you stay safe and warm and dry uh, and that you do not have aching muscles from too much snow moving. Uh, blessings to you all and I look forward to seeing your papers.